thanks from my side. Uh, thank you very much, Craig, for being in time and setting the scene uh, that perfectly. Da. Um, we, Martin and myself, will focus on another example, neighboring country to Switzerland, the Austrian Semantic Earth Observation Data Cube, um, short sentocube.at. It's a different flavor of a, a Earth Observation Data Cube. We focus a bit more on the analysis aspect and what we do a bit differently to the other data cubes. Um, Craig has already mentioned the amount of data we have. Uh, opened by the Landsat Archive. Copernicus is the biggest data provider worldwide now and others are to follow. So we have a lot of data. You see here a uh, time lapse um, of Salzburg. So in the middle of the image, uh, that's Salzburg where we are located. Um, what you also see is that the images are maybe not perfect. Some would say they are noisy. Uh, you see clouds, you see snow. Um, we don't consider that as noise. We think every observed pixel is valuable, depends on the application case. So in our approach, we take care of every pixel within the data cube. We can use also the cloudy pixels in the analysis if we want to, or filter them out on the fly. The same is true for all the other um, observations we have. This is a uh, Sentinel 2, and our data cube is at the moment mainly related to Sentinel 2 optical data, multispectral. But Martin will also show that we transfer our approaches to other multispectral data as well. What Craig also mentioned, and here again a bit with an illustration, we see a big change in workflows. Now, so a few years ago, typical processing would be you download data, you do an analysis, and you deliver it to the end user. That has completely shifted. Craig also showed you how many data we have per day. Sentinel 2 is uh, observing at least every five days at the equator and even more towards the poles on the land surface, a new image. We have Lancet data, we have Sentinel 1, we have Sentinel 3, and so on and so forth. So it's not possible anymore to do these old workflows if you do um, a time series analysis, if you want to make use of all the data available. So we switched here. To the other part, we have a data provider that's sort of a pre-processing and somewhere in the cloud, analysis-ready data is produced. Uh, the definition of analysis-ready data is changing. Uh, the tools are changing, but that's more or less um, what, what we are working now on. And in the cloud, usually where the data is, the analysis takes place. Uh, so the EU analyst, as well as the end users, can have access to that. We, we wrote a paper about that a few years ago, um, where, where we try to, to make clear how the differences are. That means we also have to react differently on these new developments. And there is an advent of a lot of big EO data analysis platforms. Most of them you know maybe, yeah, Google Earth Engine, the most prominent one. We have Microsoft Planetary Computer. Um, even Amazon is providing a lot of web space for uh, providing the open source data, Sentinel Hub, and so on and so forth, you name it. These big um, EO data analysis platforms are often provided by large companies or large research institutions. They collecting, again, petabytes of open access data on their own. They are not producing the data on their own. They're just collecting the open source data, usually paid by all of us, the taxpayers, all over the world. They have ease of use, pre-configured platforms. You can easily use, for example, Google Earth Engine and can, on your fingertips, analyze a lot of data. If you look in, into the publications of the last years in that respect, a lot of them making use of that platforms. And there's nothing to say against that, but um, we want to make one point here. Greg already mentioned it. We have that um, elaborated a bit more in detail in that journal paper you see here on the low, lower right. Think global, cube local. Um, we think there is another aspect there um, to also keep smaller platforms alive, to allow smaller research groups to do their own analysis and not rely on a specific platform. The dependency on a specific platform has some problems. Um, so you have a general loss of control that can limit the diversity of users, limiting R&D because you are relying on the analysis workflows given to you, provided by you by whatever provider that is. 
And we argue that there should be a possibility for also local solutions. That is what, what Craig, for example, mentioned with the Swiss data cube and the other data cubes to use and contribute to big EO data analytics, enable new and different analysis and product development. These are sometimes not possible with the large scale systems where you have to rely on the given implementations. What are we doing here? What is the bit different flavor? You have seen that from the title. We call our approach a semantic Earth observation data cube. I will show you in a minute what our definition is for a semantic Earth observation data cube. Our idea is to make Earth observation data a bit easier accessible. That means, if possible, programming free. Martin will give you some demonstrations later on about that. And we want to allow cloud-based analysis of terabytes of data on the fly, like the others as well, but with a different approach. Um, by this, we also want to tackle what, what um, Greg mentioned, um, SDGs, the challenges we have, provide better decision support um, for decision makers. What we are, um, or what is required to implement such an own approach, Again, we need access to compute storage um, and access to big EO data resources. We need that. Uh, that can be different cloud providers, at least in a proof of concept size. Uh, we are a quite small country, Austria. But if we scale it up to Austria and show and demonstrate that it can be scaled up globally, then for a research group, that is maybe enough uh, without going into the biggest petabyte dimensions. We also rely on flexible and that's adaptable software. Greg mentioned that also uh, before. We will come to that later. And we do our own developments on top. That is in the pre-processing step. I will come to that. We call that semantic enrichment of the data. But also, if we work with semantic information in the semantic querying within our data queue. And by that, it's possible to create your own cloud service for big EO data analysis, even if you are a small team, uh, a small research institutions like we are, in that case, five people plus students. How does it look like? We have, as Craig mentioned, temporarily stacked EO data, EO images. Um, it's a view or physical data structure, whatever you prefer here. I'm usually coupled with analysis-ready data. Craig already mentioned that. The main goal is abstracting data storage from users. Uh, no one is taking care where the data is located. I will draw my AOI and work on that through time. I don't care how many data sets are used for that and how they are stored somewhere. With our approach called Semantic EO Data Cube, we want to go beyond analysis-ready data. So we are starting from semantically enriched data, um, which allows programming free access and an even higher abstraction of data storage from user access. So instead of querying pixels and reflectance data, we use some sort of categories. Our definition um, is depicted here on the left. It's also published down there in the data journal um, by first author Hannah Augustin. The definition we think is the definition for semantic geo data cube. Um, it's a um, data cube where for each observation, at least one nominal, that means a categorical interpretation is available and can be queried in the same instance. So it's important that every pixel is already pre-processed to a category. Huh? Not yet land cover classes. I will come to that on the next slide. But we can query based on, for example, intensity of vegetation instead of reflectance value of whatever number you give. Um, we can implement this concept with different data cube software. In our example, we are using also the open data cube, um, as Craig has mentioned, for the Swiss data cube. How does that look like? These are the key components of a semantic EO data cube. Um, three main components are mentioned here. That's the number one here, the images. We use all the images available. They can be cloudy, they can be snowy, they can be perfect, whatever. Every image is taken, every pixel uh, we have, and every pixel is fully automatically semantically enriched. Uh, so um, you will see that on the next slide, we use a physical model here. So no training samples are needed 
And by that, it's also transferable globally. So it works everywhere and is reproducible. Additional data sets, geodata, any geodata can be integrated as well. For example, elevation models, whatever national data you want to use in your data cube, you are free. Uh, you can even use already thematic layers like different land cover data sets in addition. On the left, we have the data cube technology. That is the core, the heart of the analysis process. Um, User-defined areas of interest and time intervals abstract data storage from user access, as mentioned before. Martin will elaborate on that later. And then we need a web-based inference engine. That means if we have thematically enriched data, we need a different approach to query the data. Uh, that can be, in our case, programming-free, high-level semantic query on the categories we have stored for every data set in addition. What is the semantic enrichment or how we define that? So every EO image in our data set has a so-called semantic skin. Yeah? It's interpreted already to a sort of a semantic level. So to each reflectance value, we have a spectral category that can be intense vegetation, bare soil or built up, different water glasses, snow, different cloud glasses, and so on. Our approach we are using, I will come to that on the next slide, is transferable between multi-spectral sensors. They need to be calibrated at least in top of atmosphere um, reflectance values, otherwise a physical model will not work. Um, if you have atmospherically corrected data, even better. We are using for that um, a tool called SIAM, Satellite Image Automatic Mapper. Um, if you have another tool at hand which interprets your data fully automatically, you can use that as well in our experience. That is at the moment the best working um, tool in that respect. You see that on that animation, that's an overfly over the Alps, where the data is now transferring uh, slowly into the categories. Uh, so we now see the colors. We have now per pixel a category associated bare soil build up, intensity levels of vegetation, cloud versus snow, you see that quite nice here, Turkey's snow and the white clouds and so on. And that we are doing for every image. It's fully automated based on a physical model yeah. that makes it based on a physical nice. model. Yeah. Then, yeah, we need no parameters, no training samples, and it works in near real time at the moment. We, we are always improving that. Um, on a tile-based basis, parallelize that. We are below five minutes for a central two granule. Um, so it's it's quite fast. Um, it's scalable. We can parallelize that in Docker containers and it gives you a multi-sensor support. So that works on central two, that works on Lanza, that works on central three, that works also on very high resolution data. And you see here on the left, 33 spectral categories are um, the, the numbers of of classes, so to say, we uh, derive for all of these images and make them accessible in our data key. That's again, such an overview, again, a few on uh, the Austin German border. Um, it's an older scene of Central 2, and that is how the spectral categorization looks like. Keep in mind, that is not a land cover classification. Huh? So it, the pixel, it's a pixel base, so not looking into context solution. So it's the thing we are working with. There would be better ones if we have scalable deep learning models in the future, which give us perfect land cover units per central two scene. We are happy to use that, but we are not there yet. So it's inferior to land cover. So that means even if we as humans see on the image, that is a lake, that is a river, Per pixel, we have only spectral categories like deep water, turbid water, and so on, and not looking into the context. Please keep that in mind. But if we aggregate that through time, analyze that through time, we again come to a higher semantic level and can draw more conclusions based on that. I will now hand over to Martin, who will explain a bit more the technical aspects of the data cube um, technology.